So thank you very much. Everybody will know this picture. March 24th, 1989, a ship under the command of Joseph Hazelwood ran aground and spilled about 11 million gallons of oil into the Prince William Sound. This is Captain Hazelwood calling in the accident. Yeah, uh, tell me back. Uh, we uh, should be on the radar there. We fetched up uh, on the ground north of uh, Cush Island. So you're notified over. Now as you listen to that, you might begin to get into your head the thought that got into many people's heads when they heard about this accident, which was, was Captain Hazelwood intoxicated at the time that he drove the super tanker aground? Captain Hazelwood said he wasn't. He said he'd only had four vodkas before he got on the ship. The blood alcohol level the next morning indicated he must have had at least six times the legal limit in his blood at the time of the accident, but he denied it, the lawyers fought it, and there was a long battle in the courts to determine whether at the time of the accident he was intoxicated. And the conclusion, the legal conclusion, was that there was some doubt about that fact. But there was no doubt that Captain Hazelwood was an alcoholic. His mother testified to the fact. In 1985, Exxon treated him for alcohol dependency. After the accident, Exxon's president said that he had thought that Hazelwood had mastered his problem, but Exxon had missed the fact that in 1986, he had had his driver's license revoked for driving under the influence. And in 1988, he had had his driver's license revoked for driving under the influence. Indeed, at the time he captained a super tanker, he was not permitted to drive a VW Beetle because he had had his license revoked. But forget for a second, Mr. Hazelwood. Think about those around Captain Hazelwood. The other officers, the people who could have picked up a phone, people who, while a drunk was driving a super tanker, did nothing. What do we think about those people? Now, I want to talk about the question of responsibility here. Because I think that we often, when we talk about responsibility, obsess on the criminal in the middle. And too rarely think about the people surrounding that criminal. And my view is that's a mistake. It's not a mistake because that individual in the middle is innocent. Of course he's not. He's guilty. But there are other guilty people here, too. And we are too quick to forget these others, these good people, these decent people, these people who could have picked up a phone, but who don't. Now, I think I've been thinking about this issue for most of my life. It feels like most of my life. But it came into sharp focus when I got a telephone call from this man. Indeed, it's an extraordinary fact that I see him here today because I didn't know until this morning when I read the program that he would be receiving this award that he received today, John Hardwick. I received a phone call and a phone call and a phone call and a phone... He was a real asshole, that Hardwick. <laughs> Asking me again and again, would I please help him in this case that he was bringing 
to hold an institution responsible for the criminal acts of its leadership. And then again and again, I had to tell John I couldn't. I was too busy, too busy. And I read about the lawsuit that he filed in the New York Times. And it actually seemed to me a relatively simple case. Pretty obvious there was responsibility, no doubt of the liability. Absolutely clear John Hardwick should win. And then a couple months later, about a year later, I read that the lawsuit had been thrown out. And I was astonished. And I looked up the opinion, and I found in the opinion the following statement. This court is constrained, the judge wrote, to hold that the act, the act granting immunity to nonprofits, insulates charitable organizations from liability for any degree of tortious conduct, no matter how flagrant that conduct may be. Contentions that employees and agents of the American Boy Choir School acted willfully, wantonly, recklessly, indifferently, even criminally, do not eviscerate the school's legal protection. And I was astonished at that holding. And I looked up in the statute, the stat, in the statute books, the statute that was being spoken of, and it says that no nonprofit corporation shall be liable for the negligence of any agent or servant of such. And I thought, negligence? Is that what the judge spoke of when he spoke of willfully, wantonly, recklessly, indifferently, even criminally violating the rights of students? Is negligence the same as willful, wanton, reckless, indifferent criminal action? And of course, the answer is obvious. It's not. So finally, I don't remember, two years after John started pestering me, I picked up a phone. And I called him. And I volunteered to help him in this case. And I joined an extraordinary lawyer, a lawyer named Keith Smith. I couldn't find Keith picture on the internet, so here's another Mr. Smith. He looks just like that. Right? <laughs> and Keith and I worked together to appeal this extraordinary judgment. And in the Court of Appeals, the New Jersey courts, we got that judgment reversed. And then we took it to the Supreme Court. And two years after the argument, the Supreme Court affirmed the judgment, stating that the school was responsible. A school could be liable, which would mean, of course, if the school could be liable, we could rely upon insurance companies to make sure that somebody would pick up the phone when this happened again. And this is the key to remember. The law is about a system of incentives. The incentives are there to protect kids. And this is the thing that the law can do. There's a fox myth out there, right? That <laughs> <laughs> juries are out of control. That's the idea. This is, this is a technical legal term. This fox myth is bullshit. <laughs> As a study by the American Bar Foundation found of the 25,000 jury verdicts which they reviewed, uh, only 5% of these cases awarded punitive damages and the amounts were generally modest. But the point is that 5% is critical for it forces responsible behavior into a system of accountability that protects those that can't be protected by themselves. This is what the law can do. It can help build this sense of responsibility outside of the criminal in the middle. Sense of responsibility. See these little sheriff badges I put on each of these people? The, each of these people bear a sheriff's badge in the sense that they are responsible to do something to make sure that the person in the middle does no harm. Now my view is we need this sense of responsibility elsewhere too. In the last couple of years of my work, I've been focusing on this institution, an institution which is politically bankrupt, 
institution which right now has an approval rating of about 22% because people believe in this institution money buys results and therefore an extraordinary amount of cynicism builds up around that institution. Why are we cynical? Well, number one, we see it, this money, the explosion of campaign costs leading these people to spend 30 to 70% of their time raising money to get back to Congress. It makes them dependent in the sense that any dependency builds. They're dependent, as this writer puts it, on lobbyists as suppliers or pushers in the system of money. Indeed, the New York Times had this wonderful story about Chuck Schumer coming to Wall Street to beg Wall Street for money for his campaign and the campaign of the Democrats. And the Wall Street titans accused him of being insufficiently pro-Wall Street, one indignant fellow standing up and demanding his donation back. Now, remember, this is Chuck Schumer. No man in the US Senate has been more responsible for turning over complete freedom to Wall Street than Chuck Schumer, but even he needs to bend on his knees to grovel to this institution increasingly, which seems to control Congress, right? And then we see the silliness from this. As was mentioned, I spent about 10 years of my life working on this issue, copyright. It began on that day, 1998, when Congress passed a statute in honor of this great American, Sonny Bono. It's the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, a statute which extended the term of an existing copyright by 20 years. Now, of course, Congress, when it was passing the statute, was supposed to be asking itself, does this advance the public good? Does it make sense to extend an existing copyright? And what we know about copyrights is that they're designed to create incentives. And what we know about incentives, at least in every universe governed by the laws of physics of this universe and not the laws of physics of Star Trek, is that incentives are prospective. No matter what the US Congress does, George Gershwin will not produce anything more. So it could not make any sense to extend the term of an existing copyright. Indeed, when we challenge a statute in the Supreme Court, this left-wing economist, oh wait, that's Milton Friedman, right-wing Nobel Prize economist, said he would join a brief challenging the statute as not advancing the public good only if the word no-brainer was in the brief somewhere. So absolutely clear was it that this could make no possible public good sense but apparently there were no brains in this place when that statute was passed. An easy public policy question which Congress gets wrong. Or another obvious, think about nutrition. Consensus among those who know something about it that we eat too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff. 2003, the World Health Organization decided they wanted to advance public policy on the basis of that consensus. They promulgated a standard that said no more than 10% of your daily caloric intake should come from added sugar. Well, the sugar industry, they have that sweet little logo here, they went ballistic. There they are, ballistic. <laughs> they got the Senate to threaten to withdraw funding from the WHO if the WHO didn't back down from their extraordinary claim. They wanted the WHO to hold that 25% of your daily caloric intake could come from sugar. Well, the WHO didn't back down, but our government did. 2003, the Food Nutrition Board promulgated a standard that said 25% of your daily caloric intake could come from added sugar. So here's a balanced diet according to our government. You can start with Fruit Loops or M&Ms for breakfast. You can then have glass of milk and a cheeseburger for lunch. And for dinner, you can have pepperoni pizza. Indeed, three slices of pepperoni pizza and, of course, sugar cookies for dessert. That's a balanced diet according to our government. Again, an easy public policy question which our government just gets wrong. Or think about most profoundly the context of global warming. There is, of course, or at least there was until there was snow in Washington this year, a consensus <laughs> about global warming. The consensus is we're doing it. As Al Gore describes it, the debate is over. There are five points in this consensus. Number one, global warming is real. Number two, we human beings are mainly responsible. Number three, consequences are very bad. Number four, we need to fix it quickly. And number five, it's not too late. Someone wanted to study how solid that consensus was. 
So they reviewed a thousand articles published between 1993 and 2003 in peer-reviewed journals. Found that zero percent, exactly zero of those articles questioned the basic consensus. Then they did a comparable study in popular media articles roughly the same period, 1988 to 2002. They found that 53% of those articles questioned the basic consensus. And that's, of course, the product of the extraordinary junk science that has been spread into the field here, allowing members, especially of the Republican Party, to delay any actions about this for at least a decade, probably much more. Again, an easy public policy question which Congress gets wrong. This bankrupt institution gets wrong, yet we confuse responsibility here. Just two weeks ago, Matt By wrote this piece in the New York Times where he criticized me by saying, the problem with Lessig's indictment and others like it is that they're too hard on the lobbyists. It's that they're too, e I'm sorry, not, it's not that they're too hard on the lobbyists, it's that they're too easy on the politicians who cave to the pressure. The flaw here is that if our senators and congressmen really wanted to be ideal public servants, they wouldn't need us to protect them from their corporate patrons. Rather, they would simply do what's right and face the consequences. So the picture here is the congressman in the middle, you can tell because he's got a flag on his lapel button right there, surrounded by other people, but it's the person in the middle who is the guilty one. But my view is it's not enough to blame or rely upon the addict here to solve the problem. It's not enough. We need others surrounding that person with this problem to take responsibility, to push them, to demand from them the courage that we believe that they need. And the self-righteous sneer against them is not enough. We have to demand that they do what's right, but it's irresponsible for us to demand it when we have not done our part too. To get them to do what's right, we have to do what's right, and then we can sneer at them. Now, there was much good that came out of this case, as you've heard, clear law in New Jersey, which is an inspiration to many other states. But in the process of litigating that case, there was bad, too. Of course, extraordinary burden by the plaintiff. And there was extraordinary burdens created by the outrageous behavior of the insurance company, including outing me personally before the Supreme Court of New Jersey. But it's not that bad that I want you to focus on here. I want you to look at this institution, the New Jersey Catholic Conference. You look at this and you think this is a harmless institution. Look, they respect life. They believe in family life. They believe in social justice. They have an education program. And indeed, you look at their public policy committee. They say that too often politics has become a context of powerful interest partisan attacks, sound bites, and media hype. The Catholic Church calls for a different kind of political engagement, one shaped by the moral convictions of well-formed consciences and focused on the dignity of every human being, the pursuit of the common good, and the protection of the weak and vulnerable. Right? Let's make sure this is clear. Moral convictions of well-formed consciences focused on the dignity of every human being the pursuit of the common good, and the protection of the weak and vulnerable. Now that institution made an appearance in this case, a series of briefs filed by that institution. And after my description, you think to yourself, well, of course, they must have been making a brief appearance in that case on behalf of the weak and vulnerable. They must have been, in that case, on John Hardwick's side. But of course, they weren't in the case on John Hardwick's side. They were in the case arguing that the standard of immunity of the district courts that granted absolute immunity to this institution, even though it had knowledge of the criminal acts of those who ran it, 
should be preserved, arguing that they, the American Boy Choir, and by the way, the Catholic Church too, should be immune from any responsibility. They should be absolutely immune and focus the law solely on the evil person in the middle. Now that kind of behavior, I think, suggests that we create a new character on this picture. <laughs> A kind of character of someone who should have known better and acted to make things worse and could easily have done something different. That's who that character is. And when we think about that character, we should think about the conspiracy that is spreading across the country to avoid responsibility in contexts like this. And we should call it what it should be called, shameful. A shameful conspiracy by those who should know better, who are committed to the weak and vulnerable, except when a checkbook is at stake. Now, this responsibility, this theory, this understanding of responsibility, I suggest has a wide range of characters. This play has many characters. There are heroes. Hardwick is one. There are criminals, the people who do the acts which cause the harm. There are sinners, those who encourage by blocking responsibility those who do the harm. And there's the rest of us, those who stand around the harm as it happens and need to choose whether we will do something, whether we will pick up a phone to stop it. Combine all of these characters, and there's a single message we need to carry from an event like this. Until we stop the abuse, only one character on that slate is innocent, the one who stands up. The rest of us, from the person who did the harm, to the sinner who stopped the responsibility, to those of us who don't pick up the phone, the rest of us are guilty here. Now, think about that in the context of one more important struggle. The state of New York has a statute of limitations, otherwise known as the simply out of luck statute. Simply out of luck statute in New York says that a victim of abuse must file a lawsuit within five years of becoming of age of majority. So the child at the age of 10, abused by his teacher, has until he's 23 to file a lawsuit. Becomes 18 and five years later must have filed a lawsuit or has no remedy against the abuser. Now, my view is that standard is ridiculous. I know five years after I turned 18, I didn't begin to understand the harm that had been done to me, it would take me another 10 years to get to a position where I could begin to articulate the consequence of the harm that was done to me. And that's the same with any ordinary person suffering this type of abuse. And so in this struggle too, there are heroes. There are two members of the New Jersey, of the New York Assembly, Margaret Markey and Ruth Hassel Thompson, who have introduced a bill to radically change this statute. There's Professor Marcy Hamilton or Cardozo, who has been working to change this as well, to change it to a 10-year statute, giving people who were abused a one-year window to bring a claim on behalf uh, against the abuser to at least begin to get a recovery so that they can deal with the harms from that abuse. The New York Assembly has passed this statute three times. The New York Senate has not once passed this statute. So when we think about responsibility, I want you to think about 
your responsibility here. You can go to a website. I created this little bit.ly link, NY Justice, and you can join a petition to get this state to change its law. You can follow tweets like TP sex abuse who follow this story, or you could even go to the New York State Catholic Conference and ask them whether they will stand for principles better than New Jersey did in this fight and stand up for the weak and the victim, the people who are victimized and help them against this statute. But what you do here doesn't matter whichever one you want is fine. What matters is that you do something here. Because again, this is the chant. I want you to hum it as you leave. Until we stop this abuse, all of us are guilty. Until we stop this abuse, all of us are guilty. Let me give you one more thought. Responsibility is often a talk about them. We need it to be a talk about us, people who picked up a phone. We get this. Survivors, we get this. Each of us, of course, survives this harm differently. But all of us recognize this kind of responsibility. We see it in our own lives. We see it in our past. We can see it in a million other contexts. The world's oblivious to this. It allows evil to go unchecked in all sorts of contexts, but that is our opportunity here. We have the chance to teach them something about this. We can teach them about the importance of those standing around, picking up the phone, and doing something about the evil they should see. We can show people how this responsibility is taken. Because it's not just in this place, in this issue, that there are critical problems that need serious attention. There are a host of institutions incapable of attention, distracted at the moment we need them to focus, unable to focus like a pilot playing on his laptop when he should be landing a plane or a surgeon flirting during surgery or half of you on your cell phone when you're driving down the highway. We face these critical problems requiring serious attention, but none of our institutions are capable of focusing that attention. And who is to blame for that? Who is responsible? Our culture points to this person. We should at least get them to see this person. No doubt there are evil people here. They are responsible, of course, but not just the evil people, the good people, the decent people, the people who could and didn't pick up a phone. Too often, us, us, we, especially we, the most privileged here, it is our responsibility to teach how to fix this. Because the most outrageous part is that these corruptions of responsibility, of accountability, of protecting the weakest are primed by the most privileged in our society. But they are permitted by the passivity of the most privileged in our society too. Thank you very much.